being attacked by a cat. <laughs> oh, kitty, no. Kitty, no, that's This my week foot. on the Canuckonomicon, <laughs> Junior gets eaten by a feral cat. <laughs> kitty, no. <laughs> Go away, kitty. <laughs> Deep in the forbidden wildernesses of Canada rests an ancient tome filled with forgotten lore. This book, the Canuckonomicon of the mad Canadian Guy Lafleur, is the book we shall open now. Before we begin, we wish to honor all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. We acknowledge that the ancestral and traditional lands on which we record this episode are Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting ground for many Indigenous peoples, and in particular, our neighbors, the Paul First Nation, Enoch Cree Nation, Alexis Nakota Sioux Nation, and Alexander Cree Nation, on whose territory we share our stories today and on whose territory we stand. You remember that Guy Lafleur puppet that you had when I was a kid? That wasn't Guy Lafleur. That, that was um, uh, Ron Duguay. Oh, that's right, Ron <laughs> Duguay. <laughs> this guy, I don't know. What, he was a right winger, I think, or something. I think he was with the Canadians. But then when I saw him play, he was with the uh, LA Kings. And he would skate really fast forward, and then he'd go back, then he'd skate backwards so that his hair would flow. <laughs> just like, he didn't ever seem to do anything on the ice other than like make his hair look magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Ron mm. Duguay. Why did I think it was Guy Lafleur? <clears throat> oh, the, I don't know because he it was the Canadian's jersey, probably. Oh, uh, I thought Guy Lafleur also had like. Glorious locks that he would did flutter for a time, yeah, yeah, but not, not quite as glorious as Ron Duguay's. <laughs> All right, so I'm Junior. This is uh, my pod father, Dirty Clyde. <laughs> and uh, last week was our god or uh, godfather episode. <laughs> god, yeah, that included yeah. the hind end of a horse. <laughs> uh, no, last week was our Father's Day episode, but today is actually Father's Day. Yeah, it really is. Um, but today we're going to be uh, celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day, which is next week, traditionally celebrated on the solstice in June. Um, and uh, we are going to be. It kind of gets lost in the crush of Pride Month, um, but June is actually Indigenous Peoples Month in Canada. Um, so I wanted to do uh, an Indigenous Peoples episode to kind of celebrate that and to bring some of their less lesser known um, stories a little more into the forefront and into Canadian thought, because they're, this is more their country than it is ours, and by ours I mean white people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they are our first nations. I mean, they're the people that first settled. That's correct. Yeah, um, these countries coming across that land bridge or being plopped here by aliens, whichever theory <laughs> you believe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I just I wanted to celebrate that, and so I did some research, and I found a what I think is a fascinating and very Canadian figure. Um, from the First Nations. And I say very Canadian. You'll see why. And I'll get to a little bit about that. But he fights in some battles that I think have made our country what it is today. Um, these are countries that kind of uh, encapsulate uh, Canadian identity in a very special way. Mm. Um, so, and uh, for, those, for my American friends, what you heard at the top of the episode there is what we call a uh, land acknowledgement um, that is something that is practiced in Canada in accordance with the um, Truth and Reconciliation Committee recommendations. Um, and it is basically a way that we acknowledge that the land that we live on is not really our land. Or it is our land in a kind of a more corporate sense and that we're all treaty people now. Um, so I just wanted to explain that because I know about over half our listeners are American and may not know what a land acknowledgement is. Um, so with that out of the way, let's talk about Mike Mountain Horse. Happy Mike Mountain Horse from, uh, 
The River Cree Casino. <laughs> New. <No. laughs> no, actually, Mike Mountain Horse is on Burton. Um, he's from further south. He's from the Lethbridge area. Uh, he lived on what was at the time called the Blood Reserve. Oh, yeah. Um, it's got a different name now. I have it written down here somewhere. I'll f- get to it when I get to it, it. It's probably one of the First Nations names, like in Cree or something. It is. Uh, unpronounceable. It, this one's actually pretty pronounceable. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mike Mountain Horse was born 1st of November, 1887, on the Blood Reserve in Alberta, Canada. Um, there isn't a whole lot of details that I was able to find on Mike Mountain Horse's childhood because the book that he wrote now goes for about $200 on the collector's market. Really? (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's a pretty... It it wasn't published for long. It was published after his death. Um, It's called My People, the Bloods. And uh, it's it's apparently a a great primary source for kind of understanding early 20th century uh, First Nations life. Um, And we don't have a lot of primary sources for that, but it only went through one print cycle as far as I can tell. Um, but what we do have, uh, we do know that when he was six, he was caught stealing rail ties and stacking them up on the rails, um, which prompted his mother to send him off to the residential school. (laughs) (laughs) You don't hear about that very often. (laughs) Everybody thinks that with the residential schools that all these kids were just all of a sudden rounded up into rail cars and (laughs) sent off to school. And to be fair, most of them were. Uh, somewhere. Yeah. yeah, somewhere. Mike wasn't. Mike no, was sent. Mom sent him. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was a rotten kid. That's right. Um, he needed some white man bringing up. <laughs> that's right. Uh, he was a fan of playing soccer and also apparently a skilled sprinter. Um, even later in his teen years, racing under the name of Mike Deerfoot. The rest we kind of can extrapolate from what we know what First, First Nations life was like at this time. Um, at the time, amendments to the Indian Act had been made in 1905 and 1911 that were basically designed to make it easier for the government to take land from First Nations reserves in order to sell and develop it. Specifically, the new laws allowed the government to move First Nations people further away from any white communities that were more than 8,000 people, and which allowed the government to expropriate land from the First Nations reserves uh, in order to develop a public work, in this case, roads, railways, and to basically displace a reserve away from a municipality if it was deemed, and I'm quoting, expedient. Hmm. In other words, if we just didn't like having them there, we can move you guys, just because we think it's faster that way. Yeah, it depends whether the member of parliament was living in your uh, area or not. <laughs> it's exactly yeah. it, yeah. Um, In 1914, another amendment was passed that required First Nations people to get permission from the government anytime they wanted to appear in First Nations, quote, costume, or to perform a traditional dance or ceremony. Um, This is also after the Indian Act was amended to require First Nations children to attend residential schools. We know that Mike Mountain Horse was sent to an Anglican residential school at the age of six. Um... Life in a residential school would have probably been pretty difficult. He would have been required to only speak English and to never speak Blackfoot, which was his language. Um, He would have had to have cut his hair short and not wear traditional clothing, instead being forced to wear a uniform that would have been in the English style in this case, because it was an Anglican school. Um... We know that physical and sexual abuse was rampant in residential schools, but we don't know what life was like for Mountain Horse himself. Uh, As far as I can tell, he probably wasn't victimized, but I don't actually have any proof one way or the other. Um, We do know that his life would have been pretty regimented and very strict. It would have been tough at the very least. Um, Despite these hardships that had been put on him by the English, however... We know that he actually did end up joining with the Northwest Mounted Police, uh, serving as a scout and a guide in the still relatively unsettled wildernesses around Lethbridge, Alberta. Um, Mike's father was a warrior named Mountain Horse. That was just his father's full name was Mountain Horse. Um, And he fought in what was called the last great battle against his tribe's enemies at the Belly River, which travels through Northwest Montana and Southern Alberta. This probably explains why Mike's younger brother, 
at the outbreak of the First World War, um, decided to enlist. So people at this time were, uh, were required to enlist if you were a white. <laughs> if right. you're a white male of... Mandatory draft, and, and you are considered a citizen if you're a white. Yeah. Um, the uh, First Nations, however, were considered wards of the state, essentially legally children. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so they weren't required to enlist, but they were permitted to, if they chose to enlist. Um, so, and Mike's younger brother, Albert, uh, mountain horse did choose to enlist. Um, he actually didn't just choose to enlist. Uh, he had been training as a cadet from his teen years, um, and kind of obviously wanted to kind of take on some of that warrior spirit that warrior history that his family mm-hmm. had in a way that he could in the early 20th century as a first nations person um so he ended up joining with the 23rd alberta rangers at the outbreak of the conflict uh this is honestly in my opinion incredible because he wasn't an isolated case a lot of first nations people chose to enlist in the first world war um, which is bizarre to me, <laughs> to me per- personally. Um, they were not being treated well by the Whigs in Ottawa. Uh, they, like I kind of went over, they, they had a lot of their land and their rights were being taken away by the uh, government in Ottawa at the time. Um, but many of them still chose to enlist in World War I. So we're talking First World War. We're not talking the quote-unquote just war that was World War II. This is the one that's all about just blank checks and a random assassination and about a bunch of alliances that just kind of cascaded into a war. Yeah. Um, According to the book Rogues and Rebels by Brian Brennan, um, James Dempsey, who was Mike Mountain Horse's great-nephew, Uh, offers three possible reasons that they might have chosen to enlist. Um, For many, the war offered an opportunity to practice the the traditional warrior ethos that had been part of many First Nations tribal traditions. A great example of this warrior ethos reason for enlisting you can find in the American uh, Joe Medicine Crow. Joe Medicine Crow was the last Crow war chief. He fought in the Second World War with the Americans. To become a uh, war chief among the Plains First Nations, he had to complete four tasks, counting coup, so touching an enemy without killing them, taking an enemy's weapon, leading a successful war band, and stealing an enemy's horse. To complete the first two, he defeated a young German soldier in hand-to-hand combat and was prepared to choke him out and kill him, but relented when the soldier cried out, Mommy. In doing so, he completed the first and second uh, tasks as he had disarmed the soldier. Um, The third and fourth task he completed when he led a unit and successfully captured not one, not two, but 55 Nazi SS war horses. Joe Medicine Crow is an amazing figure, and I would like to do a whole episode on him, but he's kind of outside the purview of our show at this time, being an American. Um, but I, I think if you want to look him up, I would do so. He's a, he's a fascinating figure. His story is very, very interesting. And he's also a great example of a soldier who enlisted uh, with the First Nations warrior ethos in mind. Um, But getting back to our story, another reason that James Dempsey gave for First Nations men enlisting in the First World War was loyalty to the crown. That's right, because uh, uh, the queen was their mother. Mm -hmm. Well, she was the great white mother, yeah. The great white mother. Um, At this time, it was king. Right. Um, But yeah, they, they felt that pretty much everything that had been done to them was... By the people in Ottawa, Mm -hmm. which to be fair, technically was (laughs) in a lot of ways. Um, But they felt they still owed an allegiance to the great white father, the King of England. Um, They felt that all these unfulfilled promises were not his fault, but the faults of the Whigs in Ottawa. 
And Canada, we need to remember that ultimately, early on, Canada was not a, a country. At this time, we weren't even an independent country from England. We were still part of the... We were a dominion. Yeah, we were a dominion of England. Um, but even before that, we weren't even a dominion of England. We were a privately owned corporation, a corporate entity designed solely to pump out furs. Um, we tend to look back on our fur trading history with a bit of kind of whimsy and and romance. Yeah, it's our romanticized view of our <laughs> of our history. Yeah, yeah, but we need to remember that it was really no different than India. So the East Indian Trading Company, what were they there for? They were there for spices and. Their rule of India was solely as a corporate dictatorship. And like, and I'm talking like what we tend to think of as a sort of science fiction futuristic idea of an evil corporation taking over a country and ruling them ruthlessly solely to pump out money. That's not science fiction. It happened. <laughs> and it was called the entire settlement of the non-English world. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. <laughs> the colonial period. Yeah, the colonial period, it was all about corporate interests ruling countries. Mm -hmm. And that happened in Canada, too. So a lot of the treaties that were made weren't actually made with the permission directly of the crown. It wasn't like they sent a letter back overseas to get permission from the king or queen to sign this treaty with whichever First Nations group they were talking to at that time. It was more, how can we get money out of these guys? Mm -hmm. How can we basically turn these guys into a resource. Well, and also, I mean, almost, almost every single company, so you're talking about Hudson Bay Company, you're talking about the Northwest Company. Um, all the little independent ones. And all the little, all were headed by someone named Sir or Colonel. <laughs> yep. So they were yep. tit- titled individuals from England. Yeah, and in some cases, Russia. And uh, after the uh, rebellion of the United States, there were even American companies that were doing it. Right. Um, We talked a little bit. I don't, I didn't talk anything about the Russians, but they're uh, in the story, the legend of the Nahani Valley. They actually have an incident that was precipitated by uh, Russian involvement um, in a, a trade agreement Mm -hmm. because they had been blocking rivers that were supposed to be uh, for use by the English only. Um, but then the Russians owned the land around the rivers, and so they were blockading them. Mm. <laughs> Just crazy stuff. Yeah. So we ultimately everything was was meant to enrich these corporate interests. So they, the First Nations, felt that they they still owed some loyalty to the crown, but not to Ottawa. So while a lot of the white people are going over there to fight for king and country, they were only going over there to fight for the king. Mm-hmm. But I won't say all of them, but a lot of them. That was that was their reasoning. Well, they didn't have any rights as Canadians. Absolutely not. Time. No, none. No. no. Um, and the final reason that was given by James Dempsey is the one that I think is the most likely in most cases. And that's simply adventure and escape. They were looking for a way out of reserve lifestyle, which was getting increasingly untenable at that time. It's not great now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's there's a number of reserves in Canada that don't have clean drinking water. Yeah. Um, but back then it was even worse. Uh, I don't know if this is, I have to look up the exact date, but there was something passed called the Peasant Farming Act, where basically white people could farm using tractors and backhoes and stuff. Right. But the First Nations people had to use only hand tools. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, yeah, it was... It really showed that that dichotomy where where the the British or the Canadian government at the time um, really felt like uh, they were somehow the saviors of these yeah of these people and you know uh, if there's a perfectly good European bred human being. <laughs> he, yeah. he should be farming that land because only they know how. That's right. And because if you know, there's any First Nations people that want to do it, well, they can, but they can't use the same competitive. They can't be as competitive. They can't compete. Them. Yeah. Yeah. They, it so. has to be barely subsistence. Right. They right. Have to, 
<laughs> it's just nuts. It's crazy. Yeah. Also, their their whole enfranchisement laws. Mm-hmm. Enfranchisement is one of the most deceptive turns of phrase ever because what it really did was disenfranchise them from their tribal roots. Right. To become enfranchised, you couldn't live on the reserve. You lost all, any treaty rights that you had, which they had some, but they lost all of them Mm -hmm. if you became quote unquote enfranchised. This is more in the 60s. Um, And you had to go live in white communities. The white communities wanted nothing to do with you because you're First Nations. And then your people wanted nothing to do with you because you tried to become white. Mm -hmm. And so they were left completely disenfranchised from everyone and everything they knew. And yet they, the government called it enfranchisement. Yeah. Some glorious term. Yeah. Become a full Canadian citizen, but also lose everything that makes you who you are. And you still can't vote. <laughs> and you still can't vote. Yeah. Um, so anyways, going, getting back to our story, James Dempsey's talking about adventure and escape. You can, you can see there's always been a certain level of attraction to the military life if you are a disenfranchised youth. That continues even to this day. Like I was talking with a uh, chaplain out at um, at a, a military base in northern Alberta when I was in seminary, and um, he was talking about like a lot of the men, the young men who come in and join the military now, and a lot of them they're trying to escape abusive situations. They're trying to find purpose and meaning in their lives. A lot of them think it's a it's basically a way of committing suicide that will get them glory and honor Mm -hmm. so that they can die a glorious and honorable death. And then they just end up peeling potatoes. (laughs) Or the military maybe helps them find some of that purpose. Right. Um, It's, it's kind of a two edged sword. Um, So it's, it's totally understandable why a lot of these young first nations men would see this opportunity to basically find a new tribe a new life that might get them some sort of recognition, some sort of enfranchisement that they're lacking in their home lives because they've been taken away from their parents at a young age and forced to live at these, what were often called boarding schools, but right. they were the re- we came to real call them residential schools. Um, they're having their culture erased, and yet this new culture that's trying to assimilate them isn't. Right. Um, they're not interested in assimilating. Them. No, no. They just well, want them to go away. Yeah, that's exactly it. And and so maybe they could look at the military and see that as an opportunity to get some of those bonds. Right. Um, despite all this, though, Mike himself. So Albert Mountain Horse, Mike's younger brother, did enlist right at the beginning of the war. But Mike never really had much interest in enlisting himself. Um, What we know, we know a little bit about Albert. Albert was born in 1895 and had been training as a musketeer since his early teens. He was about 19 when the war broke out and he enlisted. He signed with the 23rd Alberta Rangers and was sent overseas to France where he fought in the Battle of Ypres, which lasted from the 22nd of April to the 25th of May in 1915. Uh, the, this battle was also the first mass use of poison gas by the Germans on the Western Front. He likely would have been involved in the Battle of Saint-Julien, which started after the Germans were uh, gassed the Allies. Um, the 1st Canadian Division would ultimately win the Battle of Saint-Julien, but Albert would suffer the effects of the gas. In total, Albert Mountain Horse would be the victim of three gas attacks. Wow. Shredded his lungs. Um, and to the point where they actually invalidated him, in, invalidated him out of the military. He was so, right. his lungs were so badly damaged. Um, and he was sent back to Canada. He never even made it home. He died before he got there. He got to Montreal where he contracted tuberculosis and died of tuberculosis uh, at the age of 22. Wow. In Montreal before even making it back to Alberta. Thus ends the life of a Canadian hero. Yeah. Yeah. Mike would later write, Reared in the environment of my forefathers, 
The spirit of revenge for my brother's death manifested itself strongly in me as I gazed down on Albert lying in his coffin that cold winter day in November 1915. Mike Mountain Horse was an experienced man. He was 28. He had been serving as an interpreter and a scout for the Royal Northwest Mounted Police for some time. Mike was also huge. I actually have his uh, found his enlistment record. He, at the time he enlisted, was six feet tall and had a 36-inch chest. <laughs> like, this is a big guy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um he was an ideal soldier. He was in good shape and Canada wasn't really one to turn down men who wanted to go to Europe at this time. No. <laughs> so this is the beginning of the second war. This is still the first war. So, oh, okay. Uh, Cause his brother died in, within the first year. Right. And was sent back. And so, uh, he, Mike, he wasn't going out of a sense of loyalty. He wasn't going out of a sense revenge. of adventure. It was revenge. He wanted revenge against the Germans for killing his brother. Um, Mike's older brother, Joe Mountain Horse, uh, enlisted with him, and the two set off for training. They received training both in Canada and England and were assigned to the Canadian Expeditionary Force, shipping out to France in 1917. Mike Mountain Horse joined the 50th Canadian Battalion and fought in two of the most famous battles in Canadian history, Vimy Ridge and Passchendaele. So this is where I say he's a very Canadian figure. Mm-hmm. To uh, to my American listeners, the thing about Vimy Ridge and Passion, the battles of Vimy Ridge and Passchendaele, is that they were uh, not just regular battles; they were battles where Canadian soldiers were under the command of Canadian officers, which was almost unheard of. Because- and one using Canadian tactics. Exactly, yeah. it, it was unheard of for this to happen because we were a colony of England. And so England didn't like to have actual experienced officers in charge of units. They put British upper class gentry gentry in charge of units at this time. So the idea of assigning a Canadian officer (laughs) as a commanding officer in a battle was unheard of. But they were desperate to capture Vimy Ridge. It had been resisting capture for months. The Battle of Vimy Ridge was part of a larger offensive by the British being fought in the Nord Pas de Calais region of France. It was fought from the 9th to the 12th of April in 1917 with the goal of capturing a German high ground that no other force had been able to capture, which was Vimy Ridge. The attack was supported by something known as a creeping barrage, a tactic that had actually been developed by Canadian soldiers. Uh, in a creeping barrage worked, it was also known as a rolling barrage, where the Canadian troops would follow behind a barrage of artillery fire. So at the time, one of the biggest problems with artillery is that we didn't have modern aiming technology. So to aim, they basically kind of had to do some math and then hope they hit their target. The idea of a creeping barrage is it would take out part of this math. Um, It would allow them to, basically they would raise the aim of the uh, artillery cannons to put them slightly further ahead, slightly further ahead with each shot, and the infantry would follow in behind. The idea here was that the uh, artillery barrage would then strike the enemy trench just as the Allied soldiers are reaching that trench, which would basically, hopefully, uh, put the enemy into disarray while leaving um, our soldiers in a position to capture the trench. So normally, you would bomb the trench, then you'd send your soldiers over no man's land, they'd kill each other in no man's land, and nothing would get accomplished. A creeping barrage would keep the enemy soldiers hunkered down, so that as soon as you cease the barrage, your soldiers are in position, able to go in and capture them while they're in the trench. It was an extremely effective and bloody tactic. (laughs) Um... So the 50th Battalion, which included Mike Mountain Horse, was tasked with capturing Hill 145 from the Bavarian Reserve Force. They were joined in this attack by the 4th Canadian Division, making several attacks against the hill before finally capturing it. After that, they turned their attention to a smaller rise that was also known as the Pimple. Once again, the combined undermining efforts, rolling barrage, and sheer determination of the Canadian troops allowed them to capture the hill from the Bavarian forces. 
Mike described his experience and thoughts regarding Vimy. Lying on top of Vimy Ridge one night, along with a number of other Indian boys, the scene before our eyes might be best described as that of a huge stage with lighting effects. Very lights from the Hun lines and flames from the bursting shells in the city of Lens. The red glare thrown back appeared like the great fire in the sky all the time. The trenches ran through almost to the heart of the French coal mining city. Here, a brigade of the Germans had entrenched themselves so well that the incessant bombardment of artillery and bombing from the air did not aid the boys from the Dominion to any great extent, although they had been in this sector for a very long time. Along the miles of trenches, one could see planes dropping bombs on the German lines, followed by geysers of smoke and dirt shooting skyward like volcano- volcanoes erupting. One could wit- would could witness houses bursting suddenly into flames as projectiles from heavy artillery of the enemy struck them. One could walk past Canadian howitzer batteries about a mile from the trenches in front and hear the 57-inch shells from these guns screaming overhead on the errands of death and destruction. Mike was one of the quote-unquote lucky ones. 3,598 were dead. 7,004 were wounded in the fight, but Mike made it out unscathed. The 50th was pulled from the line to rest for a while. Mike uh, wasn't finished, however. He, along with the rest of the force, shipped off to what was perhaps the second most famous Canadian battle, Passchendaele. The 50th Division was involved in capturing Hill 70 in the battle and succeeded as well as engaging in dangerous urban battle within the city of Lens. During the fight, Mike suffered a case of shell shock, but quickly recovered and returned to the fight. On August 21st, 1917, during the battle, Mike was struck by a uh, bayonet and trapped in a building. After being rescued, he was sent to an English hospital to recover. He wrote a letter which read, I am now in an English hospital for wounded colonial soldiers. All we have to do is to get well, and at the present time, I am getting along fine, although they've told me that I've got to stay for another two months before I am again fit for active service. I hate the idea of staying here doing nothing and offered to go with the first draft leaving for the trenches. The officer in command said he admired my pluck, but he could not take me, so I am doomed to stay in this place for some time. We all had to behave like men in France, and I think we did so, although well knowing the nature of men facing us. I got a slight scratch from a Prussian guard during an engagement in no man's land. The fellow caught me with his bayonet and on the outside of my arm but I proved superior to him, although he made it hot for me for a time. In early 1918, he returned to service in Europe and was part of the 100 Days Offensive, which ultimately ended the First World War. Mike would uh, mark mark captured German artillery with a simple uh, Nitsitapi. So the Nitsitapi is the name of the blood tribe. That's that's the uh, name of the reserve now is the Nitsitapi Reserve. He would mark it with the uh, symbol of the Nitsitapi at the time called the Blackfoot Confederacy, um, which was a group of First Nations who lived in the border region of Montana and Alberta and which the blood people were a part of. Another unique project, and I think this is the most interesting project that uh, Mike Mountain Horse undertook. Um he actually made a story robe detailing his actions in the first world war, specifically for his battle in the battle of Passchendaele. Mm -hmm. So do you know what a story robe is? Yeah, I I think so. (laughs) What do you, what do you think it is? Well, I think, I think if you're, if you've done a remarkable accomplishment, you then, um, embroider or have embroidered a, a piece of cloth uh, telling the story with pictograms. It's pretty close. It was pictograms. It wasn't embroidered. It was painted onto a piece of hide. Oh, okay. In this case, it was cow hide. Um, it's, it evolved from that tradition of uh, decorating teepees. Right. Um, if you've seen uh, 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 First Nations teepees, how they're often painted with designs of buffalo hunts and battles... Um, this is this evolved from that tradition, which itself evolved from even more ancient traditions of like painting on walls and on caves and stuff. Um, so Mountain Horse recorded 12 of his wartime experiences, and I'm going to read them out as they're described by Mountain Horse himself in The Great Deeds of Ma- Mike Mountain Horse. 
I will do my best to clean up some of the text uh, just because a lot of the work was actually damaged. Um, so we, we have a lot of missing pages from the original manuscript, and so we don't really know necessarily what he wrote down because white people at the time weren't super interested in what a brown guy had to write down. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I will include in the show notes a picture of Mike Mountain Horse's story robe, which I think is probably one of the most interesting pieces of artwork from the early 20th century that I've personally ever seen. Mm -hmm. So uh, feel free to interrupt and ask questions or whatever as we go along here, Clyde. Oh, yeah, you know, I have a cold. I'm, I'm <laughs> popped up on cold medicine. <laughs> <laughs> I've been real quiet today. It's unusual. Well, you know, this isn't something I'm going to cut up about. <laughs> it's just, already it's a sensitive topic to those of us that live here. And, yeah, it's, it's true. And, it's... Yeah, and you know what? To be fair to this man, he's not only as a, as a First Nations person, but just as a Canadian, took part in... Uh, you know, what, what we call the great war. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but for Canadians, it's an especially great war because it, those two battles in particular were the ones that identified Canadians as their own fighting. Yeah. Force. After Passchendaele, we actually earned a reputation as shock troopers. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it really solidified the identity of Canadians because we had first nations people working with, French Canadians working with white English Canadians in a battle that was being run and operated by Canadians. Yeah, because none of the other troops in the Allied forces were able to do it. Yeah, and it, it, so it, it for us is a really, it, it's bizarre. We celebrated, which is such a weird thing, we memorialized. Um, I think the hundredth anniversary of of Vimy Ridge a couple of years ago, because mm -hmm. um, it was nineteen seventeen that it was fought. That's right, and the war was finished in eighteen. Yeah, I mean that was, and that was the well, turning point. Passchendaele of the war. was, yeah, yeah, Passchendaele was the turning point of the of the war. Um, it was the final shift in momentum that pushed us uh, into the German lines because mm -hmm. that was a. That was the thing about the First World War is it was a stagnant war. Yeah, it was a stalemate. Of, it was just a lot of people sitting in trenches staring at each other and mm -hmm. taking pot shots. Yeah. <laughs> and huge casualties because of it, because the old style of warfare was sit in your trench, send all your men over. Yeah. You can always get more back at the farms. Yeah, and it's just, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just uh, cool and it's uplifting to know that, you know, th that some of these stories still survive. Yeah. My old pipe teacher rest his soul harry lunan was a piper yeah. in the battle of high wood on it, the eeps let's be clear uh, he was a bag piper <laughs> he was a bag piper he, yeah. he walked ahead of the troops yep yeah. um and there was like machine gun fire all around him most of the guys in his unit were killed and he alone was standing there piping while while fighting was going on in the wood yep yeah. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of awesome stories yeah. that that survive from this, and I I just I found Mike's was just so unique because mm -hmm. not just because of the battles he fought in, but because of what he did afterwards with this story rope. So I'm going to read some of the entries that he wrote about it. Yeah. Um. So to begin, um, on the FreeLibrary.com's article, a warrior's robe, it notes that the top panel of the piece, which depicts soldiers entrenching as well as Mike Mountain Horse's scouting party, is partly ornamentation, and it's also partly to describe some of the other events in the panels later on. Um, it's To give you a quick description, it's broken up into these kind of squarish panels, almost like a comic book, and it has a kind of artwork that he had hired a friend to do for him um, that it's a lot like the artwork you would see on a teepee in traditional First Nations art. Um, but depicting things like soldiers in trenches and carrying rifles um, would have been very early uh, semi-automatic rifles at this time mm -hmm. is what they would have been using. Um, so panel number one, this is Mountain Horse's most important exploit. It states August 21st, 1917, the 50th Battalion of Calgary attacked the German trenches. Corporal Mike Mountain Horse led his machine gun section on an old building behind the German defense. On obtaining their objective, Mountain Horse heard noises in an old cellar. 
He called upon the enemy to surrender, but received no answer. Then he descended the stair. Looking down, he saw a German officer kneeling and aiming to shoot. And here's where the page is damaged. Um, he quickly fired at the officer, killing presumably the officer, um, but he himself was wounded. So this is when Mountain Horse actually became wounded uh, towards the end of the war and was sent to uh, convalesce in an uh, English hospital before eventually returning to service and then going back home to Canada. Um, panel two. Mountain Horse and companions are seen leaving the line of march and going to the top of the hill to scout for the enemy while shells burst overhead. August 10th, 1918. M. Mountain Horse, with two others, was sent ahead by their commanding officer at the Battle of Amiens to examine the country ahead. An honor of this kind coming from a superior officer is an important factor in the life of an Indian warrior. So going back to um, the Crow Nation we were talking about earlier, about leading a war band, that's essentially what he would have perceived this as. Mm -hmm. So leading this scouting troop was a way of leading a war band that he had been honored to, to lead a war band would have been a big honor among First Nations people. Um, panel 3, August 11th, 1918. At the Battle of Amiens, M. Mountain Horse of the Companion shot three Germans who were in a trench. After the enemy soldiers had surrendered, they fired on the Canadians with machine guns. <laughs> so a little bit of a false flag <laughs> going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, number four, the wavy line is a trench and the captured German has his hands raised at right. The guns of the Canadians in the trench are shooting at the retreating soldiers. August 11th, 1918, at the Battle of Amiens, a small party of German soldiers were approached unawares and bombed out of their trench by the mountain horse, by the M mountain horse section. The enemy soldiers were shot down with only one captured. Number five, Mountain Horse can be seen lying in the deep hole. August 21st, 1917, Mountain Horse was buried in this old cellar for four days. He had gone down the cellar to get enemy soldiers who had surrendered to the Canadians. While he was down, a German shell wrecked the roof of the cellar. And Mountain Horse was buried beneath the wreckage and left for dead. Obviously didn't die. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was. I, I did remember reading about that he was trapped. This was during the Battle of Lens. So after he had been injured, um, he ended up trapped in a cellar for several days before he was eventually rescued and sent to the hospital um, to recover. Um, number six, at the Battle of Amiens, August 10th, 1918, after the Germans had evacuated their trench, M. Mountain Horse and his section chased a number of Germans out of a small hut, killing several Germans. From all indications, the German soldiers had been eating a meal. The Canadian soldiers ate the meal instead. <laughs> uh, yeah there you go if it weren't so tragic it'd be comical <laughs> i know right um august 10th uh, 1918 number seven at the battle of amiens a machine gun section was bothering the right flank of the 50th battalion a mountain horse and his section killed the german gunners who were responsible they also captured their guns Number eight, at the Battle of Amiens, M. Mountain Horse and his section killed a few survivors of a German battery and marked the German artillery with the marks and designs of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, number nine, August 21st, 1917, Mountain Horse captured two German soldiers who were patrolling no man's land. Number 10, August 9th, 1917. So he tends to go a little bit back and forth. Right. Um, linear time... Like, writing in linear time is actually a very Western tradition. Mm -hmm. Almost nobody else does that. <laughs> That's a very Western European idea. Uh, kind of comes out of the Greeks. If you look at uh, a lot of old uh, ancient Near Eastern writing, a lot of old Chinese and Japanese writing, and even First Nations storytelling, ten things tend to be a little more cyclical right. and a little less... Um, linear and tend to be grouped more by subject and less by time. Right. That's a very uh, Western European thing to think in time, terms of timelines. Right. Um, so August 9th, 1917, while on patrol duty, Mountain Horse fought hand-to-hand -hand with three Germans, killing two of the Germans with his war knife. 
August or number 11, the wavy line is a trench with a smaller trench leading to a machine gun nest. Of the four Canadians outside the circle, the one on the right has been wounded. May 12th, 1918, M. Mountain Horse and three companions were sent on a daylight raid on a German machine gun outpost. All of the Germans were dispatched and one of the Canadian soldiers was, was wounded. Number 12, a huge German shell wiped out all of the Mountain Horse section at the Battle of Amiens. But good luck favored Mike. He was unharmed. So those are the 12 panels of uh, the Mike Mountain Horse story robe. Um, and it is, it's a fascinating piece of artwork. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll show it to you later, but uh, I will be putting a link to it on our uh, show notes that uh, our listeners can go take a look as well. So that sums up Mike's war history, but it's not the end of his story. Uh, Mike returned home to Canada after the war, where he was celebrated by his tribe. He had achieved the rank of acting sergeant and had received a Distinguished Conduct Medal. He was celebrated by his tribe, um, but not only that, he, unlike most of the First Nations veterans, um, was also recognized by the white community thanks to his service in the Northwest Mounted Police. Um, he was, uh, as a result, included in a lot of Veterans Day celebrations. And you can even find some more recent pictures, because I think he passed away in the early, or in, in kind of the later 20th century. Um, I think it was in the late, late 60s. So there are some more recent color photos of him as well mm-hmm. that you can find uh, as, as an older man at these Veteran Day celebrations. Um, Mountain Horse uh, resumed his employment with the Northwest Mounted Police and spent time touring detachments to educate officers on First Nations legends and history. Um, He eventually retired from the force in 1933 in order to spend his time writing and lecturing. He toured schools, he wrote for the Lethbridge Herald, um, but ultimately found that he couldn't sustain himself, his wife, and his seven kids. Um, and yeah, he had seven kids, Mm -hmm. a uh, virile man. (laughs) Um, he eventually returned to service with the mounted police. Um, there was a journalist in Lethbridge and who was also a personal friend of his who actually encouraged him to collect his stories about the blood nation into a manuscript. And so in 1939, he completed his work called Indians of the Western Plains, Thurza Young Burkett, his friend and fellow journalist, tried to find him a publisher, but nobody in Canada would take it on. And there was one English publisher who did initially show interest, but ultimately decided, and I kid you not, that it just wouldn't appeal to English people enough. Hmm. Essentially, white people wouldn't buy it. I don't think your people are reading books. so. (laughs) So they decided not to publish it. Um... So, you know, typical colonist mindset. (laughs) Um, Mountain Horse uh, was married, had seven kids, and he was finding his financial difficulties were growing. Um, He began developing a drinking problem, which wasn't helped by the fact that he was kind of a man caught between two worlds. He fancied himself a writer and a lecturer um, and was trying to kind of live off reserve, um, which led to some kind of growing resentment among his own people who kind of saw him as trying to become white. I talked a little bit about enfranchisement earlier. Mm -hmm. This is that similar sort of case. Here's a man trying to live a white lifestyle, um, but who isn't making, making it work, who isn't getting quite like he's more respected than most first nations people because of his veteran heritage or his, his, the fact that he's a veteran, um, but the people who whose heritage he shares are kind of resenting him for that. Right. Um, so his status as a war veteran did earn him some respect, even among his people. Um, they, while they were a little bit resentful about his kind of, uh, self aggrandizement, he, they still respected what he had done in the war. They, they recognized that the importance of his accomplishment, but also recognized that he kind of carried a bit of that warrior heritage with him Mm -hmm. from that. Um, So he continued uh, speaking at and attending veterans events. 
and he actually helped form the native uh, the Native Veterans Association, which was a veteran association specifically for First Nations veterans. Um, when his wife passed away, he did actually move back onto the reserve, and his distinguished history and his accomplishments in education actually got him voted onto the Blood Tribal Council in 1959, uh, despite some of his fellow counselors' criticisms about him living off reserve. Hugh Dempsey wrote, the fact that he had been in battle was more important to the tribe. So the fact that he was a soldier and a veteran yeah, was warrior. more important yeah. than his living off reserve. Um, Mountain Horse only served one term as he passed away in 1964. His manuscript was gone, all except for one copy, which was in the possession of a lawyer named A.B. Hogg, who managed to actually find a publisher for it. Now, consider it's 1964. Things have really changed in terms of how people regarded First Nations history. There was a lot, a, a growing interest in it, and um, it was published under the title My People, the Bloods. Um, so, and it, it became uh, kind of regarded as an indispensable primary resource for First Nations history, especially in the early 20th century. To this day, Lethbridge celebrates the life of Mike Mountain Horse. Um, Mike Mountain Horse Elementary School is named after him, obviously. And uh, yeah, so he's, he's kind of become a, a local figure in that area. But I just I thought his story was so interesting. I really wanted to to share it with a a bit of a broader audience. So, oh, that's pretty cool because I mean, uh, most people outside of Canada don't know anything about Canadian history. Period. No, they probably know uh, like no. There was <laughs> fur. We were fur, <laughs> fur traders. traders, and we used something about beavers. Someone further north lives in igloos. Yeah. That kind of stuff, right? Yeah. It's cold <laughs> here in the winter, right? But, <laughs> um, but I, think, I think these stories, stories of people like Mike Mountain Horse, really sort of show that we, we do have a rich and varied history here yes. in Canada. Um, and, you know, we did participate in the major conflicts of the 20th century. We did, yeah. Um, and uh, people from all walks of life participated in that. Mm -hmm. I, and I mean, I used to be like pretty much every Canadian student ever, uh, where I just, I hated social studies. I hated Canadian history for whatever reason. I thought it was boring and dumb because we didn't have knights and, you know. Yeah. Sheiks. So we and, didn't have our own civil war. Yeah, we didn't have a civil war, you know. Um, but uh, as I got older and I got uh, into university and even even my later years in in uh, high school, I started to realize that no Canadian history is really actually very interesting, and it's a uh, we. It's kind of weird to think that we share some of it with the Americans, but we do. Mm -hmm. We do share a lot yeah. of the early settlement. But the the direction that our history goes compared to American history is completely different. Yeah. Um, they were forged in a, a war against uh, their rulers. Mm -hmm. We were forged in a war on behalf of our rulers. Yeah. Um, so to give you guys a little bit of idea what I mean there, after, we bought our freedom. Yeah, after Vimy Ridge and Passchendaele, that was actually the first time after World War One when Canada became recognized as an independent country. That was when Canada became not just a dominion of England. Yeah, we weren't just the uh, uh, part of the Commonwealth's troops. Canadian troops were. Uh, yeah, their own battalions. Yeah, yeah. And, and even beyond that, politically, on the more grander political sc scale, uh, we had leverage at that point to basically tell England, no, we want to be an independent country now. We want to rule on our own behalf. Mm -hmm. And uh, we exercised that at the outbreak of World War II when we actually wait 24 hours in order to allow our vote to go through Parliament before siding with the British in World War II. Right. Just to make sure 
that we decided on our own to go. It was an important moment in Canadian history. Mm -hmm. And so Mike Mountain Horse was, as a First Nations person, a huge part of that. He was, he was obviously an accomplished and decorated soldier. And he also, um, through his writing, uh, through his, his story robe, he gave us a perspective of it that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Right. And, be, and we are very lucky and blessed to actually have this story robe still preserved in a museum down in Lethbridge. Mm-hmm. And to still have, even though it's out of print now, his book, which tells us the story of his life, how he became a soldier, what he did in the war. Um, because these stories um, give us a perspective that is not that of the white man. It gives us a perspective that's different and and uh, unique to to the First Nations experience, which helps us to understand what it was like to be First Nations at that time and to kind of give us a bit of perspective of what it's like to be one now. Mm-hmm. So that's something I don't have because I'm, you know, fat white guy <laughs> sitting here in a in a well appointed basement. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so how old would he have been at the outbreak of the Second War? Um, Because when did the Second War start? 39. 39. So he was 27 in 1915. Oh, so he would have been almost 50 already. Yeah, right? that's probably why he... But I, I couldn't find anything about him uh, participating in the Second War. Yeah. He would have been a lot older. Um, and he died in, his, in, uh, in the 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, so he <laughs> would have only been in his sixties probably cause he was born in 1888. So yeah, no, but so 18, oh, he, he would have been in, almost in his fifties already when, when the second war broke out. Yeah. And so, so you add another 20 years to that. He yeah. Been in his seventies or his eighties. when. He oh passed, yeah. So he was a, so, he was yeah. an older guy when he passed on, yeah. but, um, yeah, so it was, I, I just thought this was a, a fascinating story. Um, if you guys are able to go pick up the book rogues and rebels, um, because it, it, it's a, it's a collection of shorter biographies of Western Canadians, who had an impact on history. Brother 12 is in there when mm-hmm. we did a two parter on him. Um, that's where I first found the book and, uh, Mike mountain Horse is in there as well. Um, I, I go into actually a little bit more detail than the book does. Uh, cause I was able to find some other sources outside of it. Um, but there's a, a whole slew of interesting Western Canadian figures in there. So I would encourage you to go pick it up. It's a great book. It's well-written, well-researched and a great resource, but thank you all for coming in and listening. Um, next week, I don't probably going to be talking about hairy fish next week. Oh yeah. (laughs) Looking forward to another cryptid story. Yeah. So we're going to get into a little bit of a lighter topic next week again, because I I don't want to keep it all just serious history all the time, but uh, so we'll get into something a little goofy next week. Um, I'm also, I can't tell you details yet. But next week I'm recording. Finally, You'll tell us next week. Well, no, I'm recording. Finally, uh, I'll talk to the person about when I can announce when the episode's coming out. But I'm going to be guesting on two podcasts over the next couple months. So look forward to that. Hey, hey! All right, keep your eyes open. Stay classy, San Diego. <laughs> Economicon is a production of Crossing Clay Studios. We can be found on Twitter at Canuckonomicon, and you can contact us through email at Canuckonomicon at gmail.com. Please be sure to share us with your friends and family and keep your eyes open.